In the United States, we, like you, have a long history of celebrating those who served. At best, our policy reflects the ethos of one of our earliest presidents, Abraham Lincoln, who charged all Americans with this solemn duty to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. Since its founding in 1930, almost 90 years ago, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs has evolved tremendously. Our policymakers and care providers have learned much about what it means to support veterans and their families in meaningful ways and what happens when you don't. Our wisdom has grown exponentially during the past 17 years of conflict, but we're still learning. We regularly look to our partners for new insights and inspiration, and I applaud your willingness to do the same. Today I want to unpack why supporting veteran families matter, to uncover the social and behavioral health risks of weak social connectivity, and to share some wisdom around how the Ukrainian Ministry of Veterans Affairs might build engagement that extends from government agencies and NGOs to the community level, where it's often most powerful. Well-supported military families are what we call a force multiplier. They extend the capacity of a modern military. I'll say it again, because those aren't just words, their truth. Well-supported military families are a force multiplier for a modern military. We know that stable families enhance mission readiness for active duty service members. A soldier who isn't distracted by conflict or relational or money worries back home is a soldier more likely to have his or her head in the fight. The logic is simple and multiple studies confirm this reality. A similar principle applies to veteran families. Well-supported veteran families are a force multiplier for modern society. In previous generations, the nuclear family was arguably the most important social unit. Today, it's still important. However, another useful framework is this. Family is really just another type of community. And strong community is often the most important aspect of a veteran's success after service. That community may be diverse. Today's family unit may look like a single veteran parent with a young child and an extended family member who lives in. It may look like a veteran who is also a caregiver for a disabled spouse. Or it may look more traditional. Across cultures, varying definitions of what constitutes a veteran family exist. A survey of the US, UK, Canada, and Australia shows that the US and UK have the most conservative definitions of family, while Canada and Australia have a more progressive take. Their definition expands to include cohabiting partners, for instance. However you choose to define veteran family, communicating your support to them, and not just the veteran, is key. One of the best ways to signal support and build critical relationships is through listening. Too often, as experts in our fields, we tend to be prescriptive about what a veteran or their family needs. We develop programs, pour in financial resources, build out staffing, debate with other experts, all without pausing to listen to those we intend to serve, to ask questions, and internalize the insights they have about which programs and services would really do the most good for them. As you undertake the monumental and worthy task of building a Ministry of Veteran Affairs, I encourage you to pause periodically, to reflect as part of a regular cadence, and listen to those you intend to serve. The outcome of a healthy veteran and healthy veteran family is good for everyone. Military veterans tested in the furnace of battle 
often return home having undergone what one Marine officer calls post-traumatic growth. They're stronger, more resilient, more wise, and in many cases become a powerful force for good economically and socially. Adam May was a sergeant in the Army. After being wounded in combat in Afghanistan and medically discharged, he built a small construction company in his hometown of Portland, Oregon in the United States. The business thrived and he was able to hire four employees in the first year and buy a house for his wife and child. He struggled with pain from his injuries but received needed medical care and a stipend each month from the Veterans Health Administration. The help he received provided a stable pace to do good and relieved him from worry about how he would provide for his family while he worked to recover his wounded body and mind and build a new business. Last year, his strong draw to service compelled him to look for other ways to give back to his country. He established a volunteer-driven nonprofit to help other combat wounded veterans heal their emotional wounds through an outdoor adventure program. Today he runs both his business and the nonprofit. He's a leader in his community and helps dozens of civilians and veterans each year through services provided, jobs created, and outdoor adventures. Upon separating from service, 99% of veterans in America say they want to serve in their communities. So equipping veterans like Adam with stability as they recover from their wounds and giving them the opportunity to find purpose without battling just to survive ends up being good for everyone. The discipline, leadership, and organizational skills military service members bring back home make them twice as likely to succeed in business ownership as their civilian counterparts. Each year in the U.S., more than 200,000 military veterans start or grow their businesses. In America, veteran-owned enterprises generate $1.2 trillion each year in business receipts and account for hundreds of billions in payroll. It's key to remember that as a nation, we're not just helping veterans and their families for the sake of helping them. This isn't purely a benevolent venture. Rather, by providing aid to these immensely talented and service-minded people, we can unleash a force of good in our families, communities, and nations. But transitions like Adam's, from warrior on the front lines to leader at home, aren't seamless. This adjustment is challenging for a host of reasons. Let's talk about social connectivity. When social workers, like me, think about successful reintegration of service members to civilian life, they often reference the reintegrative trinity, education, employment, healthcare. This trinity represents the core of a successful transition. But undergirding that core is one powerful ancient truth. We need a tribe. We need to be connected to part of something greater than ourselves. Supporting social connectivity is key not only to good economic and social outcomes, but also to health outcomes as a whole. Connected veterans and their families are healthier behaviorally, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Social isolation is a real risk when veterans return home. Transitioning from a life of camaraderie, unit cohesion, and shared purpose to the civilian world can be difficult, particularly if that world doesn't understand military culture as a whole. Soldiers like Adam may need to redefine their purpose to build a new tribe or find one. We know that older veterans who find their social resources limited are at a particular risk for isolation and the negative outcomes that accompany it. So too are women veterans returning to a society that may not even recognize them as veterans. 
They make up a growing percentage of military service members around the world, but still experience a lack of acknowledgement, service, and support that they feel immensely. The effects of lack of connectedness are striking. Our human bodies read isolation and disconnection from others as a physical threat. Stress hormones surge, and when they're elevated too long, those affected begin to have difficulty communicating, displaying empathy, or engaging in high-level thinking. This makes connecting with others even more challenging, and isolation can easily become self-perpetuating. The links between loneliness and ill health, both physical and mental, are powerful and well-established. Often, disconnected people turn to substance use to dull their pain. Veterans are particularly vulnerable to this trend. Too often, substance use spreads pain to families and across generations and results in a host of negative outcomes. Veterans like Adam, those who have been wounded physically or psychologically, are at a particular risk. Solutions for veterans struggling with substance use and for their families must extend beyond federally funded veteran-specific programs and connect to local communities and resources. So how can your Ministry of Veterans Affairs help build that sense of support and engagement? In these last few minutes, I'm going to unpack some ideas for you. But I want you to know that rather than suggesting a model, I'm sharing kernels of wisdom gleaned over time. The first kernel is this. Keep communities connected. Again, keep communities connected. I want to share an idea called a community of practice. A community of practice is a group of people who engage in an ongoing basis in some common endeavor. In the United States, at the federal level, a community of practice exists through coordination between the Small Business Administration, Housing and Urban Development, and the Department of Veteran Affairs, and multiple other agencies. Each agency has a veteran-specific initiative that together have, in the past decade, served tens of millions of veterans, driven veteran homelessness down by 40%, and generated literally trillions of dollars for our economy through veteran-owned businesses. Interagency coordination at the highest levels is key. Currently, Ukraine has 22 agencies that I could identify that serve veterans in sub-capacity. I would venture a guess that there is a lot of wisdom buried in each of those agencies. And I would suggest that as you build your Ministry of Veterans Affairs, you find a way to extract those valuable lessons and insights from your partners through structured listening sessions. I also believe there is wisdom in connecting with other agencies to discover how they might work with you to serve legitimate needs that are beyond your scope of funding or capacity. A strong community of practice begins through effective collaboration at the top. Beyond the state-level community of practice, there exists an opportunity for the Ministry of Veteran Affairs to form an extended community of practice that includes representatives from schools, nonprofit organizations, businesses and corporations, religious organizations, neighborhoods, and other entities within a given locale. Communities of practice must be formed. They must model practices that provide communal support, challenge, encouragement, and accountability. All of these are needed to ensure a coherent system of services. In my work, I've heard innovative ideas from a variety of people, ranging from veterans to school teachers to nerdy academics like me. And bringing together these voices and resources and ideas is truly a powerful thing. I want to challenge you to be activators, leading, again, leading to facilitate these critical social connections that extend the reach and impact of the good you plan to do. 
When you reach into communities and begin building relationships that are to connect tribes, you'll probably find that those communities are underfunded and under-resourced. You'll discover good people working with very limited options, and you're in a unique position to help. So how might you build a community capacity at the local level? The second kernel of wisdom is also the answer to that question. Fund facilitators. NGOs, for instance, can provide veterans tribes to help extend the effectiveness of your programs. You don't have to do it all alone. Look to fund NGOs working to minimize social isolation, get veterans connected to non-veterans, provide service opportunities, expand professional networks, and provide career opportunities. In the United States, the Department of Veteran Affairs provides hundreds of millions of dollars in the form of grants to nonprofits serving these needs. Globally, we're blessed with many fantastic NGOs to learn from. In Canada, I think of the Veteran Transition Network, a charitable organization which serves the mental health needs of Canadian and international service members. In the United Kingdom, there's Help for Heroes which provides services ranging from career opportunities to physical rehabilitation to financial support. In the United States, I think of Team Red, White, and Blue, which connects veterans to members of their local communities through physical fitness. Neighbors gather for yoga, hikes, and runs, and build lasting relationships that reduce social isolation. I also think of the National Association of Veteran Serving Organizations a national directory that helps nonprofits, funders, and employers connect their services to our nation's veterans. I look around this room and see representatives from fantastic international NGOs like David from Team Rubicon Global, who will be speaking to you and with you shortly. Each of these NGOs supports at least one pillar of the reintegrative trinity or the requirement for tribe that undergirds it. These NGOs are often also founded and operated by military veterans who serve as transitional linchpins for the military-civilian divide. As you consider which partners to work with, I encourage you with this third kernel of wisdom, reward results. Carefully scrutinize the outcomes of the organizations you consider funding. It's easy to throw a fundraiser, to start an ad campaign, to gain press attention. But look deeply behind the veil. Which NGOs are actually able to deliver meaningful services and track their impact? Which are willing to collaborate to build that collective sense of veteran tribe? which have real substance and not just great branding, great press, or charismatic leader. Work freely with your government partners, carefully scrutinize, and then generously fund the NGOs continuing your mission at the local level. Build this sense of tribe from the top down, and you will produce a lasting impact for generations of veterans and families with the capacity to serve Ukraine in truly powerful ways. Today, we explored the wide-reaching benefits of serving veteran families well, some of the health risk of weak social connections, and three ways in which the Ukrainian Ministry of Veteran Affairs can build an effective community of practice at the national and local levels to extend the reach and effectiveness of your programs. A popular American politician once said, patriotism is not a short and frenzied outburst of emotion, but the tranquil and steady dedication of a lifetime. In serving veterans, we commit to a lifetime of noble work. To serve the veterans who have recently returned, those who came before and have borne yesterday's battles, those who will bear tomorrow's and their families. Thank you, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say roll tide.